to the various ministries. So if you did not get a bulletin, uh, please do so before you leave today. It has all the information on all the different ministries from children's ministry to Awana to youth ministry to firewood ministry to women's ministry. You fill in the blank. Uh, and we would love to get you plugged in somehow either uh, being a participant or serving in some 
degree using your spiritual gifts. Uh, so if you want to grab one of those, we also have our Get Connected wall out in the lobby. And then we also have our uh, Get Connected fill out uh, cards in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, and if there's any way that we can pray for you as a church family, uh, if you fill that out, we won't spam you with a bunch of emails, but we would love to pray for you and, and lift your name or your situation up to the Lord in prayer for sure. Uh, one main announcement, and that's really all I got for you, and then we'll do a little meet and greet. In the bulletin, you have this little uh, insert on the Fall Family Festival I announced last week. Every year, we try and do a really fun event for the family. Um, where say, bring your own pumpkins, we'll do a bounce house, hayride, we'll put on a, a fun um, fall movie. And so if you want to get uh, plugged in with that, either, like I said, participate or you're feeling like, hey, I'd love to serve and, and maybe do the caramel apple station or the popcorn station or the hayride, we would love to have you uh, fill out maybe a, a volunteer slip or something like that and get you plugged in serving for that ministry. Um, so that's coming up October 13th, and we're going to do it. It's a Friday uh, evening down in the OC Coffee House down in our basement uh, from 5 to 7. So if you see that uh, and you know somebody that might even love to participate in that as a family around town, it's an easy way for you to fellowship and get uh, people here so we can pour into them and love on them well. So there's my only big announcement. Uh, and then, hey, let's take a minute real quick. And meet and greet those around us. Give a hug, friendly smile, get to know somebody we haven't met before. Thanks, guys. Okay, you all need to find your seats and you can sit down for a minute because if you have walked through the uh, front of the church, you have seen a display of Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes out there. This is our fall kickoff week and, well, day, I guess, and we are going to start our individual boxes. Last year, our church uh, had a goal of 600 boxes. And we filled 600, what was it, 635. This year, we're going for the big 700. We can do it. We can do it. <laughs> okay, um, the boxes are there. Grab a box. We have a personal shopper program. If you don't want to fill a box, you can let me know, and I'll shop for you. I'll fill some boxes for you. I've already been doing that for several people. 
And so you can do that. There's a, a donation box back there. You can write a check to the church, put OCC, and then you'll get your tax credit for it. But um, this is a, a great way to spread the gospel throughout the world. And Billy Graham's son, Franklin, uh, was inspired by the Lord to start this ministry because parents will come when it involves their children, especially their children getting a gift. And so pastors and missionaries and trained Operation Christmas Child workers, they actually will go and they will um, minister to these kids the gospel before they get their box. And then in each one of their boxes, they're given this little booklet, and it's called uh, Greatest Gift. It's in their language, and these are printed in many, many different languages. The Greatest Gift. And these go to um, their homes. Many parents have come to know the Lord because of these little booklets being handed to their children. When children pray to receive the Lord, especially the ones that really kind of understand what's going on, maybe eight or nine up through 14, they're given a discipleship program. And they realize kids were making a profession of faith, but they didn't really have good follow-up. And again, I said there's ministers helping them, pastors, but they're given this greatest journey. These will be out on the table. You can look through it. Again, it is a 12-week discipleship program for the children that have prayed to receive Christ. And they are um, they're, they're blessed and they're matured in, in the Lord. Now, another thing that our church does, as you've been seeing some of the slides up there, we do three different events. One... We get a group of people together and we fold boxes. That's all we do. We just fold up those boxes. We folded over 600 boxes. The church has blessed us with a room to storm in. And then we have another day. We set up a plethora of things all organized with each different age groups. And then the following day we have a, a group packing party where we put these. And this year we packed 450 boxes in our church packing party. So we're well on our way to our 700. We can do it. And so these are just pictures of some of the ladies being silly. There's Stephen being silly. Um, Marie is being serious. These are some of our donated dresses. We're holding up these dresses. Um, there's Linda packing a box. And um, there is Judy and her daughter. Whoop, it's already gone. There's <laughs> That's okay. These are just shots of people as they're packing boxes for the glory of the Lord. So if you want to ever get involved in that, you will have so much fun if you come and help fold a box or help set up or help pack a box, and the Lord will really bless you. The biggest thing in this ministry is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. The way we can do that is when you fill a box or when you see those boxes or when you're just thinking about it, pray. Pray and ask the Lord to bless these boxes to get this box to the child. They tell the children, God loves you so much, and this is a box that somebody has packed just for you. So when you're packing your boxes, make them really a good example of something the Lord would have put in there. There are ideas in the box. There are stickers in the box. I will be out there with questions. But the biggest thing is let's just pray that this ministry would bring more people to the Lord for the last three years. Over 2 million each individual year, new salvations of children and adults have come to know the Lord as a result of this ministry. Amen. So with that, I will turn the mic over. That's your challenge, church. <laughs> oh, thank you, Linda. Why don't we stand up? Let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for worshiping our awesome God. Lord, we thank you for another day, another day to worship you, another day to glorify you, Father God. We just pray that this worship would do exactly that. Be with those that are hurting, Lord. Be with those that are distracted. They're just, for some reason, for whatever, just not feeling it this morning. Holy Spirit, would you guide us? Would you lead us? Bring us into your presence. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Satan and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are up on Giants we call death and gray. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are ten This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. Took our breath away. Fear so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail. Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Him, this is our God, this is who He is, He loves us.
with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I've got a friend closer than a brother. There is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me. I've got a friend And he is my strength He is my portion With me in the valley With me in the fire With me in the storm Let all my life Testify
Savior he is. What a Father, what a friend, what a Savior he is. What a Father, what a friend, what a Savior he is.
Lord, that you will never leave. That you're the incredible God of the universe who made us, who set us here for a purpose, to be your voice, to be your helper. Lord God, to be used by you to change lives. So Father, when we make it all about us, when we are focused on us, turn us around, give us a verse, give us a tapping from a friend. Help us to pursue you. Help us to fall in love with the God of the universe. Not just for all that you've done, Lord, but because of who you are. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Oh, thank you, Bart. Welcome this morning. As we like to say on at least a lot of the Sundays, you're not here by accident. Uh, we appreciate that you're here, and for our visitors, our guests, maybe first-time attenders, um, you have joined a gathering where, more than anything else, we want Jesus Christ to be lifted high. It's all about him. Thinking of the songs that we just sang, maybe some of you have come in this morning feeling very lonely, very abandoned. Maybe you um, recognize yourself in one of those songs. Um, they are designed to point our attention toward Jesus. He is our hope. He is our rock. He is the only source of salvation. And so this morning, it is our, our desire to honor him with the praise and the worship that only he deserves. If you've been a part of our last few weeks, we really are in the middle of this incredible study on an incredible subject, and that's the love of God. We spent a few glorious weeks just kind of basking in the wonder of a love that is so secure and so constant, never changing, never faltering, never diminishing, where in Romans, especially chapter 8, the Lord assures us that there is absolutely nothing in this entire universe that can even for a millisecond separate us from his love. You might not feel it. You might not be living in the middle of that truth right now, but it doesn't change the fact that that's the way it really is. And our response to that is what we've kind of been focusing on the last few weeks. How do you respond to someone who has shown so much love to you, so much grace, so much mercy, kindness, patience. How do you say thank you? Now, we began by suggesting that one of the ways we say thank you is time. It really is our most precious possession. We don't always treat it as though it were, but it is. We've added in there our talents, our gifts, our creativity, how we were made in his image, reflecting some of his character qualities, maybe more than others. And that's all part of how we use our time in service. And this morning we'll turn a corner and we'll begin to talk about honoring him and saying thank you to him with our treasure. And you might find yourself going, okay, here it comes. The Lord says so much about treasure. But I didn't feel right just jumping into that this morning because more than anything else, the treasure that we have been given that we say thank you with is just a reflection of our heart. And so this morning I really just wanted to kind of pause for a moment and look at the way someone says thank you to God with their heart. And so if you would join me in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 7. This is a, an amazing little story kind of tucked away just in the middle of a lot of events of the life of the Lord. And to set the background, we have a Pharisee who invited Jesus to come to a, a dinner. We're not told 
when, where, all, any of the details, not really important. But as we see this story unfold, Jesus is going to reveal what I believe is maybe the single greatest component of giving in gratitude, giving in thankfulness. Uh, sometimes it's been called grace giving because it's giving that's in response to the grace that's been shown to us. Um, you're going to see yourself in this story, this account of an actual event in Jesus' life. You're going to find yourself. You might not like where you find yourself, but you're in here. And we'll do our best by God's grace to remind ourselves maybe what we look like at times from God's point of view. But simple story with not a lot of details. We pick up in verse 36. Uh, the account is entitled, The Sinful Woman Forgiven. This is similar to other stories, but this is a unique story. This is a different story. And the message is really, really clear. And we're going to enjoy, if you will, sitting down at the table with Jesus and just watching all of this unfold. So beginning in verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at table. We're not told whether the Pharisee liked him or not. We're going to find that out shortly. We're not told what the motivation in the heart of the Pharisee was, but we're going to find that out shortly as well. And as was uh, the custom of the day, Pharisees were wealthy people and they generally had open areas where they entertained guests. So think in your mind pavilion out back, right? Uh, with no walls and in that beautiful Mediterranean climate where it's beautiful so much of the year, you would have kind of an outdoor gathering with a series of low tables set down, usually in the shape of a U, so that everybody could be reached. And the way that you uh, would participate in this gathering is you would kind of get up to the table and then you would kind of lay out with your feet behind you and you'd, you'd prop yourself up on one elbow um, on some big cushy pillows. Now, I've never really found that to be overly in, uh, convenient or um, comfortable, but that's the culture. That's the way they ate. And they took their time and they enjoyed each other's company. And, you know, it was generally a gathering with friends, acquaintances. So there would be much visiting going on and much, much talking. And so Jesus, being invited to this get together, he shows up and he takes his place. And uh, at some point in this dinner, Verse 37 says that uh, a woman of the city who was a sinner. How's that for a title? Um, she was known in the city for being a sinner. Most scholars will just say that's probably just a nice way of saying she was a prostitute. We do not know the circumstances of her life. We don't know if she were abandoned by her husband or her husband died. We don't know if she had any children. We don't know whether or not she was left completely alone. We don't know whether this was her only way of trying to make money. We don't know whether she just was a nasty person. We just don't know. And it's really not important to the story. What is important is that she was not a woman of great character. And everybody knew that. And she shows up, and if this banquet were at night, it would kind of be dimly lit, candles and, uh, you know, maybe a few lanterns around. But in the light of the candlelight, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to make out the faces as those would very often gather outside just to listen to the conversation that was going on uh, between the guests that had been invited. And these would be people that understood they'd never be invited to something like this. But they were allowed to kind of hang around and try to pick up what they could hear and learn from the conversation that was going on. She learned that Jesus was going to be at this Pharisee's house. And so she makes a plan. 
And part of that plan was to bring an alabaster flask of ointment. Now, alabaster was a marble, very expensive. It was mined or quarried in Egypt. And so we understand that for a lady living in Israel to have this, it, it was expensive and the contents were very expensive. Um, we know from other stories like this that sometimes this was actually kind of part of her retirement plan where she would buy something of value or it would be given to her as a gift and it would be tucked away in case she needed it to live on in the future. We don't know if that's the situation. But we do know that she possessed what was very expensive and it did not come cheaply or easily. But as part of her plan, it required that she bring it with her. So she gathers her things together and she heads off to the Pharisee's house. And you can just kind of envision her moving around until she could spot Jesus. And then she could kind of sneak in behind him. Once she was in place, verse 38 says, standing behind him at his feet. Remember, his feet would be as far away from the table as possible. Weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Uh, the, literally, the word there is to rain. <laughs> she began to rain on Jesus' feet with her tears. And after wetting them with her tears, she wiped them with her hair, the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet, and she anointed them with ointment. Now, these are simple phrases, simple sentences, but they show so much. They reveal so much. We don't know, at least initially, why she was crying. But what she did with her hair was the most inappropriate thing that a woman could do during Jesus' day. She let down her hair in public, which was at the very least immodest, but at the very most, it was immoral. Now, just imagine for a second, here you have the Son of God <laughs> who probably most of the people in that room didn't consider Jesus to be the son of God. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. And all of a sudden you have a perhaps prostitute who shows up and she begins to do immoral things to Jesus' feet. Where does your mind go? Well, their minds went exactly the same place that yours and my mind would probably go to. Ah, yeah, we figured as much. She is showing her true self by her actions. Mm hmm we knew it. You know, we've heard rumors about this woman. She's a sinful woman. And there she goes, just proving to us that our suspicions are true. You know, there is a lot more of the heart of the Pharisee in every single one of us that any one of us would want to admit to. Because we go to those thoughts, we go to those places really often when we have the opportunity. And I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. But if I'm going to be convicted about it, so are you. Right? Right? She proved that she was what we knew she was. Don't need any backstory. We don't need to know the reason. We don't, know what she's, we don't need to know what she's crying about. She just did what she should have never done. And oh my goodness, does that mean that Jesus has, you know, he's been around her before? Um, has he been involved in, with her before? Just, you know, the, the mind of, of the Pharisee runs wild. The washing of the feet, you know, um, was something that only the lowliest of slave would do. Letting down of the hair, kissing the feet, just those actions. I mean, this word, at least in this usage, is very, very intense. 
This is the same word used of the prodigal son's father kissing his son when he came back home. There's some deep emotion in that story. This is also the word that was used when Paul told the Ephesian elders, I've got to go, and you guys are never going to see me again. Because I'm convinced that where I get where I'm going, I'm never going to be let free. And I'm going to be heading to heaven from that point. And those people gathered around Paul and they kissed him with real emotion. I mean, this woman was involved in what she was doing. And as we're going to find out, there was nothing inappropriate about this at all. There was nothing immodest. And she really didn't care, obviously, what everyone thought. Because she had an opportunity to demonstrate from her heart true gratitude to the one who had absolutely changed her life. And she wasn't going to let anybody's thoughts about her keep her from doing it. And she took that ointment and she opened it and she poured it all out. And she began to, if you will, kind of wipe it on Jesus' feet. Uh, you, you know the day that they lived in. They all wore sandals. They all walked on dusty grounds. Feet would be dusty, dirty. Feet would probably be dry. You know, this is just an act of appreciation, affection, tenderness, gratitude. Just a lot of different emotions rolled up into this, this one verse. And immediately in verse 39, the, you know, the Pharisees... Thoughts are shared with us. Not with a room, just shared with us as readers. We, we get to think what he was thinking. Now when the Pharisee who invited him, that is Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, mm-hmm, yep, I figured so. If this man were really a prophet, and he obviously is not, then he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. The thoughts of the Pharisee's heart revealed. We are led to believe that this was probably, maybe not a complete setup, because the Pharisee had no way of knowing that this prostitute was going to show up and start doing this to Jesus' feet. But this would be, at least we would suggest, uh, an opportunity for a Pharisee to watch Jesus and look for something to find fault with. Have you ever noticed that when you are looking at someone to find fault with something, have you ever noticed that you always do? And again, there's the Pharisee heart in you. Something to judge, something to condemn, something to prove to yourself that they aren't what they say they are or that you don't have to be responsible to listen to them or be held accountable to their words. Looking for ways to dismiss any uh, conviction that might show up as a result of what you see and what you hear. That's the true heart of a Pharisee. And we don't like it when we see it about ourselves, but it's there. There's a self-righteousness, there's a smugness in us that unless we do daily battle with, will get the better of us and will turn us into Pharisees. And we'll go home justified after we completely and totally assassinate somebody's character or their walk with Christ or their attempt to live a holy life. Because we will have decided that they don't measure up. And that's exactly what the Pharisee is doing. He's looking at Jesus and he's, he's literally judging Jesus because Jesus is not acting like a Pharisee. 
So now that we kind of know what his thoughts are, um, and we understand from his point of view, man, a prophet would never let a person like that touch you. You'd be defiled. You know, you would be screaming and yelling and telling her to get away from him. You would be taking drastic, uh, you know, drastic uh, steps. But Jesus turns to Simon. And he just simply says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon says, say it, teacher. And again, we're not reading too much into this to read in. uh, There is no respect. There's no appreciation. There's no admiration on the part of the Pharisee toward Jesus. Because in his mind, after his thoughts were shared to us. We know what he's thinking. This guy's a fraud. This guy's a liar. He's a deceiver. This is the very kind of person that I, as a Pharisee, have been put in power to, to uh, expose and to protect our people from. Yeah, say it, teacher, whatever. Say, say it, whatever you want to say. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. The only point here that's worth noticing is there's just, there's a big difference in the amounts. One is 10 times larger than the other. One is roughly a month and a half salary as opposed to a year and a half salary. So these are, these are two differing sums for the point of this story. In verse 42, when they couldn't pay... He canceled both of them. Yeah, canceled sounds like a business transaction. Maybe we would be better off to translate this. He graciously forgave both of the debts. And just a reminder, when you forgive someone's debt, you don't just wash it away. You absorb it yourself. You give up the right to collect the money that was yours in the first place. So there's a theological suggestion here. Because when Jesus forgave our debt, he didn't just wipe it away, he absorbed it. And he paid for it. Boy, did he pay for it. Every single penny of every single debt, spiritually speaking, that we had incurred as renegades and rebels against the love of the Father, Jesus paid for to cover. So in this story, the moneylender forgave graciously both of the debts. And Jesus says to Simon, now which of them will love him more? Well, that's a pretty straightforward question. Um, And yet, look at the response by Simon. He answers, the one I suppose, and what, was he afraid this is a trick question? Was he afraid that, uh, that he might be embarrassed in front of all of his guests? Or was this more like, that's a stupid question, duh, you know, which one? Does this further reveal a lack of respect, a lack of any kind of appreciation for this rabbi? Probably, consistent with the other descriptions that we've picked up through this. Uh, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. You know, dumb question, easy answer. And Jesus said, you've, you've, judged, you've judged rightly, Simon. And then I love this next verse. Then it says in 44, Jesus turning toward the woman. So now you have the woman is behind him, and Simon is now at Jesus' back. Who is Jesus valuing now, right? He's not going, hey, Simon, you know, the lady behind. No, no, he turns to this woman, and he looks at her. He sees her, and he says to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her, Simon? The one that you've judged, the one that you have dismissed, As always being what she's always been. A notorious sinner. You've written her off. She is 
not worth your attention. She's not worth allowing her to even be even close to your house. I mean, you've, the way you've in your mind already completely dismissed her. Do you see her? And now the noose really, really starts getting tight. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. The simple, most basic demonstration of hospitality known in the culture of that day was just simply, hey, would, would you like to wash your feet before you come in and, and enjoying this meal? Would you like to take your sandals off? Would you like to, you know, not have your dusty, dirty, smelly feet that close to your food? Just, w- would you like to be able to feel better as you're part of my guest? You know, a simple gesture, but it's one of kindness. It's one of thoughtfulness. It's, it's really a way of honoring your guest. You know, for us today, I was, you know, kind of racking my brain. Um, what would be that kind of a gesture? Uh, can I take your coat? You know, can I hang it up for you? Can I get you something to drink while we're waiting for the meal to start? You know, just... Uh, what we're looking at is just these very simple, inexpensive ways of communicating value. Jesus says to Simon, when I came into your house, you, you didn't even offer me water for my feet. <laughs> yet, yet this lady, she rained all over my feet with her tears. You know, from a heart that was broken from a heart that was filled with gratitude and appreciation and love. And she's even wiped them with her very own hair. Man, nobody's ever offered to do that to my feet before. I mean, in our culture, that would be really weird. I know it would be. But the hair of a woman is a very, very... It's a special thing. You know, you've, you've never watched a lady, or at least I've never watched a lady needing to clean up a mess, and the first thing that comes to her mind is, oh, I'll use my hair. Um, that's really private. That's personal. And when she let it down, you could hear the gasps all around the room. And she didn't care. She wiped his feet with her hair. He says, you you gave me no kiss. I mean, for us, that'd be like a handshake. It would be like a welcome into our home. So Jesus shows up, and what was the greeting? Yeah, come in. Just come on in. Go find a place to sit down. No attention, no greeting, no appreciation, no welcome. You didn't even just offer me a kiss. It just was the, again, the most basic way that you would greet in the Middle East. But what it says is, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily glad you're here. I don't necessarily care at all about you. You have nothing that I need. And I'm not even sure that you are, you know, honest <laughs> or a good person. So, yeah, go find a seat. You didn't even offer me a kiss. But the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. Over and over and over and over again. Uh, You know, there wasn't anything immoral about that. That would be a a generally accepted way of showing great honor to a teacher, somebody that you valued and appreciated very much. Of course, maybe letting down your hair would would undo a little bit of that. But just strictly in the sense of of kissing feet, um, it was a recognized way of saying, I admire, I respect, I value, I'm in awe of who you are and what you do. You did not anoint my head with oil. Again, just another, a little customary. You know, we could talk about hygiene habits, and uh, we, we are so spoiled. We've got running water. Uh, we have the opportunity to shower every single day if we want to. And thankfully, most of us want to. 
So it's a nicer environment to be around. But if you lived in the Middle East where, where that was not an option, and you might go longer than a day between um, thorough cleansings, you know, body odor would be a real thing. One of the ways that you would counteract that or help to cover it would be like, well, here's a little oil mixed with just a little bit of perfume for your head. Just, just a kindness, just a way of saying, you're, you're a friend, you're special. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come be part of this get-together. And so that would be what you might expect. But if you didn't even get water for your feet and you didn't even get a welcome, uh, then the olive oil for the head was probably not going to be coming either. And Jesus just reminds Simon, you offered me nothing. But look at her. She has anointed my feet with probably the most expensive ointment that she had in her arsenal. The most precious, the most expensive, the most meaningful. And she didn't put it on my head. She put it on my feet. So therefore, Simon, let me tell you, her sins, which are many, by the way, let's, you know, we'll be honest. Her sins are many. They are forgiven. This is a perfect tense, which means that this forgiveness was offered in the past with continuing results to the present. So we know that she was saved not on the spot. She was saved before this event. This that you are witnessing as you are sitting at the table, this is an act of worship and adoration and appreciation to the Savior who forgave her sin at an earlier point in time. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. She had a lot of sins to be forgiven, Simon, and therefore it made her love much. Love recklessly, love um, expensively. It led her to do what she might never have ever done in any other circumstance. When she realized and she recognized how much she had been forgiven, there was, if you will, an involuntary response that automatically said, man, you know what? In this situation, a thank you note just won't do. A gift card to Amazon just won't do. I've got to do absolutely the most that I can do. So I am going to go and I am going to humiliate myself. And I am going to let everybody in this room think the worst of me while I rain down on his feet, wipe them with my hair, anoint them with the most expensive perfume I have. Because for me to do anything less than that would not be right. And then he says to Simon, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Simon, the problem is that you don't realize yet how much you have to be given for, forgiven for. You don't realize that your sins are many too. You sit there in your smugness and your self-righteousness and your religiosity, looking down on everybody else and making sure that you can say, well, I'm better than all of these people because I do more and I say more and I know more and I give more, so I'm good. And Jesus, again, with the heart of a compassionate Savior, looks at Simon and says, you don't get it. You think that you just have maybe even just a couple of sins that need forgiven. When the truth is that your sins are just as many as hers. And so he turns as he's facing her perhaps still, and he says to her, your sins are forgiven. Again, really more literally, your sins have been forgiven. And 
don't miss this. He didn't say, as maybe the custom would be of the day, may God forgive your sins. No, no, he said, God is forgiving your sins. God has forgiven your sins. And the people in the room caught that because their response was, wait, 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 wait. Who is this? Right? Who does he think he is? Only God can for, uh, forgive sins. Uh-huh. That's right. And so that there's no confusion, he then says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Not your works, not your tears, not your humiliation, not your expensive offering. That's just demonstration of your gratitude. No, no. Your faith that you demonstrated whenever our interaction happened, when you repented of your sins, when you came to believe in me as the Messiah through simple faith, when that happened, the faith that you showed at that moment, that is what saved you. And when you are saved, there's peace. Now, we don't always experience in that because sometimes we allow a lot of other junk to get in the way. But the peace is always available. The peace is promised. It's part of salvation. And so he looks at her and he says, you know what? Your faith has saved you. We would understand that to mean you've been a changed person. You're no longer now what you used to be. As he told another woman, perhaps, if, that same quality of character, that same, maybe even life occupation, we're not told. But he looked at her and he said, um, you know, your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. Now, now go and don't live the way you used to live. Demonstrate that there has been a conversion by the change in your lifestyle. But what really, really jumps off these pages to us out of these verses is that her giving was spontaneous. It, it was free will. It was in response to the grace that had been shown to her. And that's what I want for us to see in our giving. We're, we're going to take a few weeks and we're going to talk about, you know, what the Old Testament says about giving and how we're not required to live under that kind of stipulation. This is what you got to do. This is when you got to do it. That's all been replaced with the freedom to give as God has prospered you. So it gets to be free will. It gets to be because you want to. It gets to be because you realize how much you've been forgiven. So that you can have joy. I mean, if you write a check every week to put in the offering plate and you grumble about it and you say to yourself, boy, what I couldn't do with this money, but I'm afraid if I don't, you know, God's going to strike me dead or make me go broke. You're missing the whole experience. But when you can write a check and say, man, Lord, thank you. There was a time in my life where I couldn't do this. There have been many times in my life where I didn't have this to give. And I wanted to, but I couldn't. So thank you that I can now. It's all yours anyway. And I am finding more and more and more that when I can approach to the giving with that kind of a mindset and the joy that comes with it, not only do I have a great time, not only can I look at this as part of my worship to the God who forgave me so much, I am finding out that there just always seems to be enough in the pot to take care of what else I got to do. And it's not this exchange, well, I'll give you 10 if you'll give me 100. You know, that's, that's a good deal. And you can find guys to listen to that will tell you that. But it's just more of here. This, this is what I feel like you would have me to do. You know, for some people, that is 
For others, it's 90%. I love reading the, the stories about some of the, you know, the kind of the Colonel Sanders type of, you know, businessmen. And there's so many of them. They got to the place where they decided the tithe worked for them and they would keep the tithe and they would live on that and they would give God the 90. And you know what? God really blessed them. And those are the kinds of things that I'm looking forward to just discussing with you about because there's things about money that we just need to be reminded of. Because money is a master but it's not always a very nice master. And money is deceitful. And as soon as you start believing it, you're on the wrong path, heading in the wrong direction. So from time to time, we, we pull out the truths of, you know, Corinthians, and we talk about how God has designed this all to work. And the desire of my heart is just to be an encouragement to you. It's to invite you to trust the Lord as you worship him in your giving. And you know, you've maybe been here at least a few weeks. We don't really hammer on the giving. We don't pass plates. We haven't passed plates since COVID started. And we have a little box in the back of this room and a little box out in the foyer. And we originally thought, ooh, this is not going to end well. We're going to have to start passing that plate just because people aren't going to remember. You know what we found out? Some of our best years happened during the box years. And it was like the Lord reminding us, I don't need you to harass your people. So we just want to remind ourselves what God says about giving. And it flows from the heart that we see so beautifully pictured from the heart of a saved prostitute who comes to her Lord in worship and she gives the best that she can with all of the love and appreciation and gratitude that she can muster. That's what giving is all about. That's how you say thank you to the one who died in your place. Let's pray. You are a loving God. You are a patient God. And we stand amazed in your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to forgive a rotten, wicked sinner like me, so full of myself, so ready con to condemn others. Oh, I was the perfect Pharisee, and yet you loved me in spite of it. And not only did you save me, but you discipled me and walked with me, and you continue to do that, and you continue to reveal that the Pharisee is not dead. Lord, as we begin to talk more about giving and saying thank you with our treasure, I pray that the Spirit would be the one who teaches, and not me. These would not be my ideas. They would be your truth. Lord, I know we have folks who can't give, or they can't give as much as they want to, and we just ask that you would bless them that you would remind them that your love for them does not have anything to do with how much they can put in the box. And there are those, Lord, who maybe have just fallen into that habit of just giving without really thinking much about it, prayerfully seeking your face. And maybe as a result, they have begun to just lose the joy that's associated with giving secretly to you. Lord, we all have needs, we all have baggage, we all have things that would impact how we worship you, how we love you, how we give to you. And in our prayers that you would just work to tear down some of those strongholds, to open our eyes to some of the things that we're missing, to maybe remind us how much we've been forgiven. 
and that you would kind of stir up that love in our hearts so that everything that we give to you, both with our time and our talents and our service, as well as our treasure, would be an act of sheer joy that we might be able to be a hilarious giver the way that you instruct us to be in your word. Be with this precious group of folks right here. You know them by name and you know the ones this morning that are especially hurting. Would you, Lord, comfort them, encourage them, provide for them, lead and guide them, direct them, expose to them what maybe they don't want to see but need to. Lord, that we all might respond in repentance, ask for forgiveness, determined to live for you. Be with Michael Marks this morning as he continues to heal. Thank you so much for the good news on his brain surgery. We pray, Lord, that you would heal him, that you would remove every last bit of that malignant tumor in his brain, return him safely home. We just commit him and joy and cat into your hands. We pray, Lord, that you would accomplish your will in each of their lives, even through this. And we pray that you would go with us as we leave. Make it a great week, Lord. Make it a week in which we see your hand at work and your hand at work in our hearts. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here this morning and being a part of the family. God bless you. As you go, you're dismissed.